Hello and uh, welcome to this talk uh, on Nietzsche on saying yes to life. Uh, my name is Chris Janaway and I'm a professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Southampton. Before I start, uh, welcome to this talk and just let me say at the end you will find um, I've got some further reading, some passages that I refer to, you can look them up because I've given you the references at the end. Uh, also, there are some contact details for myself. If you really want to ask any more questions, please do follow it up. And there are contact details for the department and also the admissions uh, person if you want to uh, consider applying, which I, I hope you might, to Southampton. So, um, one of the ways of studying philosophy, one of the things philosophers do, is to study the history of philosophy. And there are thousands of years, of course, in many different traditions of great thinkers pursuing great topics, and we can still learn from them. And my specialism, really, uh, is in the history of philosophy. Uh, I'm interested in many different areas of the history of philosophy, and one in particular uh, is this very challenging, famous, but also perplexing and challenging philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who lived uh, in the 19th century. Uh, and one, one of the things I want to emphasize here is Nietzsche, even though he's a genius in many ways, doesn't spring out of nothing. He is responding to his environment, his philosophical environment, his political environment. And what I want to show today is how he responds to one particular philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer, who's somebody I'm also very interested in. So, uh, Nietzsche, as I say, is quite famous. Uh, he lived uh, in just right up to the end of the 19th century. Uh, very famously, uh, most people know, if they don't know much else about him, uh, that he is supposed to have said, God is dead. Uh, in fact, he has a character in one of his little parables say this. A madman runs through the marketplace saying, God is dead. This is a terrible thing. It removes us of all our meaning, all of our horizons, all of our understanding of our position in the universe is gone. What do we do? So he's seeing there, God is dead, as a, a problem, a catastrophe in a sense that we've got to deal with. Nietzsche, I think, also sees this as an opportunity. So what Nietzsche means by God is dead is, well, really, religion, by the time he's writing, this will be in the 1880s by now, uh, the middle of his, well, towards the end of his career, um, God is dead, what that means is we can no longer believe in the traditional religion, particularly the traditional Christianity that uh, European culture has been based on. Partly because of the advance of science, partly because of issues to do with the problem of evil uh, and, and so on. Somehow religion to the intellectual elite at any rate is unbelievable. But Nietzsche is not complacent about this. He thinks it gives us a problem and uh, the problem uh, is that of nihilism. Nihilism, in this context, I think, means uh, having no values that you really believe in or believing in values that are very negative. Nietzsche is often thought to be a nihilist. He, he isn't really. He, he thinks that nihilism is where we've got to or where we're about to get to, and he's worried about it. Uh, he develops this notion of saying yes to life, affirming life, life affirmation. Uh, and what I want to get onto that, how I want to get onto that notion is by looking at how Nietzsche was affected by the philosophy of Arthur Schopenhauer. So there is Schopenhauer. This is a famous picture of him right towards the end of his life. So he was uh, earlier than uh, Nietzsche, looking very antique there in a very old fashioned uh, frock coat. Um, and this picture was, the photograph was taken um, 1859, just the year before he died, and he's looking characteristically grim. Uh, actually, in some of his earlier photos, he looked rather mischievous. Um, but anyway, this is a kind of iconic image of Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer is, has always been given the title of a pessimist. Uh, he thinks that uh, human existence is really um, uh, an awful thing. It goes to the extent of saying that it would have been better not to have existed. Uh, Non-existence would be preferable. 
Uh, that's quite a pessimistic thought. There's no genuine proper value in living as a human being or indeed in the whole world. Um, now, that's a very negative view um, and it was for a while in Germany particularly and in Europe more widely quite hotly debated. It starts in a way from atheism. So Schopenhauer was an atheist um, and you might say in a sense already God was dead already in Schopenhauer's rather extensive philosophical system which he developed throughout his life. Um, and without God there is a sense of well that existence is purpose purposelessness, has no purpose, better way of putting it. Um, so that um, he sees the world, well we are as it were thrown into the world, we exist, we are creatures of will, we want, we have desires, we have needs, but somehow they're never fully satisfied. So it comes to this view uh, that life is effectively suffering. It's mostly suffering, or in some ways, he argues, only suffering. Uh, and that's his reason for saying that it would have been better not to have existed. Uh, he does have a solution to this, uh, which in a sense is to stop willing. If you had no desires, if you could calmly contemplate the world, in a kind of meditative detachment, then you would be free of suffering. So there is a kind of release, um, but to many people it seems a rather negative one. So just to go through a little bit more of Schopenhauer, because this is what Nietzsche is reacting to. Uh, Schopenhauer says that our essence is will. We will, we desire, we strive, we want things, we have needs. Uh, all of our uh, self-consciousness, our intellect, our sense of ego, sense of I, is a froth on the surface. Really there's this underlying reality to us which is will. And this, I think, was very influential on Nietzsche. Also, further on, very influential on Freud. In the sense the will is a bit like Freud's id as opposed to the ego. Um, so these desires are just there. They're pushing us on through life, these desires and very often they're not fulfilled. We can't ever fulfill everything that we want. Whenever we don't fulfill our desires, we suffer. Maybe a tiny, tiny bit of suffering, not getting what you want. Um, but he maps out the idea that to desire something is to lack it, which is a kind of suffering. Right? If, you, if you're wanting something, it's because you don't have it. That's the frustration of the will. Very often you carry on not getting it, or you get it, but then you just carry on wanting something else. So ultimately there's this striving, this, this willing that never really gets fulfilled. Schopenhauer makes perhaps rather a leap from that to the idea that it would have been better not to have existed, but that is definitely his view. Uh, he doesn't think that we should commit suicide, and for interesting reasons, uh, which I won't go into now. But, as I said before, he does think there's a kind of salvation. The world is terrible, right? but uh, the salvation from it is a change in consciousness in which we become detached from willing. We uh, look out upon the world with complete indifference. So he calls this negation of the will to life. The will to life is what's pressing us on to uh, acquire things, to nourish ourselves, to reproduce, and have, make more life. This is the natural way for human beings, but it leads only to suffering. Hence, negation of the will to life is salvation or redemption from this existence. So in a large book, The World as Will and Representation, Schopenhauer develops this vision of the world, uh, how to uh, understand what the value of our existence is, which basically is, would have been better not to have existed, and we should deny life, we should flee out of life, not by ceasing to live, but by ceasing to will. Okay, now Nietzsche read this book uh, when he was young and was really, really impressed by it. I mean, he, he kind of fell in love with Schopenhauer, not with the person, but with the, with the philosophy when he was young. But during the, his mature life, he came to see this as something to fight against. Surely, this is too negative, right? This is a negation of our very natural existence. And what Nietzsche tries to develop is the idea of saying yes to life instead of no. Instead of negating the will to life, 
uh, affirm it. So Nietzsche carried on thinking that Schopenhauer was very important in the history of philosophy and in the history of uh, European culture generally. He's predominantly interested in Europe. Interestingly, uh, Schopenhauer, uh, Nietzsche was not a nationalist. He was a pan-European. He, he didn't like German nationalism at all uh, and wanted a kind of European culture. So where he would stand today is quite interesting. But anyway, um, he thinks that uh, Schopenhauer presented this problem for European culture uh, because he was an atheist. The sense of meaning had somehow become elusive. Um, so this is a quote from Schopenhauer, uh, from, sorry, from Nietzsche. This is Nietzsche's own words. As a philosopher, Schopenhauer was the first admitted and uncompromising atheist among us Germans. As we reject the Christian interpretation and condemn its meaning as counterfeit, Schopenhauer's question immediately comes at us in a terrifying way. Does existence have any meaning at all? Okay, so the, the Christian interpretation was obviously in very broad outline that the world is created by a wise, uh, benevolent God uh, and that the world is something perfect or that it's, it is for the good and if we behave in the right way then things can go well for us. There's a purpose to existence. There's a meaning. Even our sufferings, in particular our sufferings, have a meaning in a grand divine plan, if you like, put it simply. But if we don't accept that view of the world at all, well, what meaning is there left in existence? And Nietzsche thinks Schopenhauer poses that question in the first sort of honest, uncompromising way. Does existence have any meaning at all? Actually, Schopenhauer thinks it does. He thinks the meaning of existence is, uh, well, to realize that it would be better not to exist, paradoxically. Uh, it's not meaningless, it's, but it, it has a rather uh, negative meaning. Nietzsche, I think, sees this as a challenge that European culture has to meet. And the challenge is nihilism. Nihilism comes from the Latin word nihil, which means nothing. So nihilism is nothingism. And Nietzsche sees nihilism as a problem that uh, he, the culture of his day, the late 19th century, has to deal with. So nihilism can mean many things. Uh, on the one hand, it's the simple idea that really we find no meaning at all in anything. Somehow the whole... Uh, reason for existing, the whole justification for existence has gone. There's no meaning at all. A real sort of sense of nothingness. Uh, another perhaps slightly more subtle sense that Nietzsche uses is that perhaps in the modern world we kind of refuse to have any overriding goals to our life. So we might say, well, if we want, uh, if we want uh, such and such a thing that gives us pleasure, then we'll have that. If we want something else, we'll have that. And we won't think about meaning. We won't have any overall goals to life. We just live day to day satisfying this and that desire as they happen to come up. Uh, sort of, you know, as long as there are enough commodities, uh, we don't ask any questions. We don't have any need for meaning. Uh, Nietzsche, I think, thinks that's a quite a bleak picture as well. Okay, so I think Nietzsche's not a nihilist. He deplores the idea of the, the modern idea that uh, we don't need to seek meanings. And finally, nihilism can manifest itself as a meaning, but one that is, as Nietzsche calls it, life-denying. So in Schopenhauer, and he also Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer also thought this was actually the message of Christianity. That's slightly controversial, but uh, you can see perhaps why, that somehow the, the, the point of Schopenhauer and of some other religions, particularly Christianity, Nietzsche thought, was actually to negate oneself. The natural self, in which we have all these desires, slightly unruly desires, some of them unconscious, we desire things for ourselves, we desire to better ourselves, we desire uh, gratification of the senses, we desire sex, reproduction, 
um, greater growth uh, and uh, domination over other things, all of these natural desires. It's as if in Schopenhauer, the, 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 the meaning of life is to actually deny all those desires that are natural to life. Is it something wrong with our very nature? Uh, and that is what Nietzsche finds in Schopenhauer, that the meaning of our existence is to deny our, our very nature. Uh, so it's a life-denying meaning. And uh, Nietzsche is particularly disturbed by that. Um, so he diagnoses what uh, has been going on uh, in uh, Schopenhauer. And Schopenhauer brings to a head this idea of a life-denying meaning that was also there in Christian culture for, for Nietzsche. And this is a quote from another quote from Nietzsche. It's because we suffer, not because we suffer, but because we can't find a meaning for our suffering that we uh, invent this life-denying meaning. The meaninglessness of suffering, not the suffering itself, was the curse that thus far lay stretched out over humanity. And the ascetic ideal, that's the ideal of self-denial, denying one's pleasures, denying one's desires, not satisfying the natural self. Right? That's asceticism is what is practiced in monasteries, for example, by denying the appetites, deliberately causing uh, um, uh, hardship and suffering, you know, uh, eating only a very small amount of food, getting up at four in the morning in the cold. All of that is asceticism, right? So the ascetic ideal, says Nietzsche, this ideal of denying oneself, uh, that offers a meaning, right? Thus far, it's been the only meaning, says Nietzsche. So his idea is that humanity, because of recognizing that uh, its existence contains suffering, is looking for a meaning for that suffering. And uh, in Schopenhauer, we find that, well, the meaning of our existence is to escape suffering by denying ourselves, by stopping willing, by stopping desiring, to be against our own nature. And this is Nietzsche's diagnosis of what is uh, the true nihilism that it, it underlies his own uh, 19th century culture. So what does Nietzsche do? He thinks, well, really what we need to do is to be able to say yes to life, he says, even in its strangest and hardest problems. So yes, there is suffering. Yes, uh, there is death. Life is finite. We lose uh, our, our nearest and dearest. Things go wrong for us. Okay, it's, it's simply true. Pessimism has, a, has an element of truth in it, which is that life is not perfect. There is suffering. There is um, dissatisfaction. Uh, there are things going against our will. The idea of a perfect happiness just never really occurs. At least we grant that much to pessimism. But his, what Nietzsche fastens upon is this idea that suffering is itself the problem. And he says rather startlingly, well, actually, it would be a mistake to want life without suffering. He says, you, ordinary people, you or you philosophers, you want to abolish suffering, he says. This is another quote. And us, well, it looks as though we would prefer it to be heightened and made worse than it's ever been. He says, look, don't think that the best thing for human beings would be to remove all sufferings from life. He himself was uh, suffered from many illnesses uh, and suffered from many um, unfortunate uh, personal relations in which he was betrayed at various points. He was lonely. Um, all kind, you, you have to think of all kinds of suffering here. Uh, and his idea is actually suffering can be a benefit to life because it's an opportunity to grow in strength. So um, he, uh, this is an idea that has been recognized more recently in psychology, that there is not only post-traumatic stress, uh, unfortunately for many people, but in some individuals, uh, a, a, a real crisis, a real suffering, uh, even an immense suffering, uh, can be an opportunity to grow an opportunity for psychological, personal growth. And Nietzsche, I think, already has this idea. 
that if you take away suffering, if you make everything absolutely easy and uh, no problem, everything is comfortable, human beings don't develop their full potential. So Nietzsche is interested in growth, intellectual growth, creative growth, growth in health, uh, and of a human being is actually becoming better. Uh, and he thinks that the, the ideal of removing all suffering would actually impoverish human beings. So when we say yes to life, we have to accept that life, yes, as Schopenhauer says, is full of suffering. But that should not mean that we negate it. It should mean that we affirm it. It's quite a hard thing to grasp. So one of the most famous things that Nietzsche comes up with is this idea of eternal recurrence. And in this passage, rather long passage, uh, he imagines somebody whispering in your ear this first bit. You'll have to live your life over again many, many, many times. And it'll never change. Everything and it'll be the same. Could you affirm that? Could you say, yes, I want my life again and again and again with everything unchanged? Or would that be a sign of despair for you? And this, I think, many people have... It, it's a controversial uh, doctrine, this idea of eternal recurrence. But many people have interpreted this as it's a thought experiment. How much do you affirm life if you could accept everything in it, including all the bad things, all the sufferings, then perhaps you, uh, this is a test of how affirming you are of life. So I think this fits into his picture of wanting to oppose Schopenhauer's view. Just because there is suffering in life, well, we might be able to accept it all and say, yes, I want that. So here's the famous uh, passage. So he says, imagine a demon, a, a little spirit came and whispered in your ear, this life as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once again and innumerable times again. And there'll be nothing new in it, but every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and everything unspeakably small or great in your life must return to you all in the same succession and sequence. Now imagine somebody telling you that. Would you not throw yourself down and gnash your teeth and curse the demon who spoke thus? So that would be the, the pessimistic um, response would be, no, because this life was, is, is not perfect. It's, it's got all these horrible things in it. I can't have it again. Or have you once experienced a tremendous moment when you would have answered him, you're a god, and never have I heard anything more divine? If, he says, if you could answer that way, then that's a test that you are so well disposed to yourself and to life um, that you're really saying yes. You're saying yes to the whole of your life, to the whole of your existence, including its suffering, including its bad parts. So there are some of the sources that I, that I promised you. The last one is from the Gay Science, uh, section 125. The other quotes that I used were from those sources. But here now, as I said at the beginning, are a few study questions for you. And I, at this point, in a live uh, sixth form conference, I would ask for questions from the audience, and we could discuss these things. I hope you will be able to go away and think about these rather momentous questions. What is meant by the death of God? Okay. Uh, it's a bit odd to think of God as dying, uh, but uh, it's presumably figurative. Try and spell out for yourself what might be meant by that. I think it means something like uh, it, we can't any longer believe in God, but then you might ask why. Uh, why does the death of God matter? Well, you might say, oh, so what? Uh, in, in the passage in the gay science, uh, Nietzsche portrays people as just shrugging their shoulders and saying, well, God is dead, well, what does it matter? He clearly thinks it does matter um, because it robs us of this reference point of um, some absolute value that we can attach ourselves to. Again, what is that? We need to think about that more carefully. Coming right to the end of the talk, does this idea of eternal recurrence make sense? So what he seems to imagine is it'll be me an infinite number of times having the same life with nothing changed. But people have wondered, well, in this life, I have no memory of any other life. So if the next one is exactly the same as this, I'll have no memory of this one. 
and from each life to the other. It'll just be a single life. So uh, actually, what am I being asked to think here? Okay. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting uh, thought experiment. It may be meant to just grab you emotionally and think, ah, yes, how wonderful it would be, uh, or oh, that would be a terrible thing, or mm, I really don't know. Um, but actually, is the thing we're being asked to think something that makes sense? And then there are more, uh, I suppose, ethical, broadly ethical questions that come out of this. He seems to think that we could value our sufferings just as positively, in a way, as our pleasures and happiness. But can you do that? Surely the point about something being suffering is that it's bad. It's bad for you to undergo it, or maybe bad in some overall general sense. Uh, it wouldn't be suffering if it was something you welcomed. So does it make sense to think of welcoming the suffering in your life just as much as anything else, right? Remember he said uh, every pain and every joy and every thought. So you, you would welcome all the joys in your life again, but you have to welcome all the sufferings as well. Can you do that? Is, it, is there any alternative to the view that sufferings are just simply bad and hence not things you could want? Okay. That's quite a difficult question, I think, uh, and it goes rather deep into a lot of presuppositions in ethics. And finally, well, okay, suppose we say, well, suffering isn't really bad. It, it, you know, it can turn out quite well in certain circumstances. You know, uh, Beethoven's suffering made him produce the greatest music uh, or, or, or whatever. There are many cases in which having to overcome obstacles leads to greater creativity and greater growth and so on. But should we really be so keen to give up on the idea that suffering is bad in itself? Um, does this open the door to um, a set of values in which we don't really care so much about the suffering of others, for example? Oh, yes, well, lots of people will suffer from this. Hey, but uh, it'll be a great uh, monument when we've finished it. Um, the suffering will actually have value because it produces something great. I is that a dangerous thing for us to start thinking? And it, it does Nietzsche open the door to um, a kind of uh, set of values that is actually quite dangerous. Those are all important and difficult questions. I hope you'll be able to pursue them. Thank you very much uh, for listening to this talk, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you.